So welcome. I'm Darren Bell. I'm going to walk you through the chapter 9 and 11 help video. And uh, hopefully this will help you complete the exercise assignment and understand the content a little better regarding payables and the management management of pay, uh, uh, payables and receivables. So we're going to cover the receivable, receivables first, then the payables. So our, the main items we're going to cover, we're going to talk about the direct write-off method for receivables, the allowance for doubtful accounts, the different methods associated with that. We're going to talk about notes payable and interest calculations. Then we're going to talk about payroll payables and just payroll calculations in general. So our first one that we're going to start off with is uh, the easiest method. Uh, this is the direct write-off method. So uh, a scenario here, let's say, for example, you're a business and you uh, go and provide some services or sell some products and you didn't collect cash right off uh, the VAT there, so your uh, customers are going to pay you later. Let's say, for example, you realize that your customer is not going to actually pay you, so what do you do? Do you leave the receivable on your books even though you know that it's not going to be really collectible? Or what do you do? So there's different methods on how to how to manage this so you can fairly and and honestly, right, get your uh, finance uh, issue your financials to other people. So if you left it on there, it wouldn't be really fair, it wouldn't be honest, right? So you know you're not going to collect on that. So how do you get rid of it off your uh, financials? And how do you account for possibly collections that you know you probably might not receive in the future. So we're going to first start off with the direct write-off method. This is the easiest way. As soon as you know somebody's not going to pay you, uh, you can just write it off. You can just expense it and uh, get rid of that receivable. And so that's something that you can do. It is not GAAP uh, approved. It's not GAAP accounting. Uh, although a lot of uh, bookkeepers and uh, and businesses do it this way. It's just easier, um, and we'll show you the GAAP uh, generally accepted accounting principles method later. Okay, so first off, this is the, this is the very first one. It's it's super easy. So here, Dexter determines that it can't collect this amount from this company, right? So this is the company that has a uh, that we have a receivable for. They're not going to pay us. So what do we do? Okay. So let's let's draw this up here real quick. Um, this is going to be uh, expensed. What expense account are we going to use? We're going to use an expense called bad uh, debts expense. Okay. So that is going to be our debit in this case, right? So we're going to debit bad debt expense. And then what's our credit going to be? Well, it's going to be the account receivable for Lear Company. My pen's having a little hard time. That's going to be the credit. Both debit and credit for this amount. This is going to be our amount that we're going to debit and credit there. So that is going to be our direct write-off method. Pretty simple. We're just basically saying, hey, we're expensing it. We may have counted it as revenue. And so now we're going to expense it. Those two will cancel out. And then uh, we've got reduced accounts receivable because we're not going to collect it. So that is now um, going to show correctly on there. Let's say a little later here on March 29th, Lear Company comes back to us and says, oh, hey, you know what? We are actually going to be able to pay, pay uh, the bill that we owed you. And so that happens oftentimes when they want to continue to do business with you or, um, you know, you report this to their uh, to the credit company, different things there. They have incentive now to say, OK, let's clear this up. We need to get this. Uh, we need to go ahead and pay this. So what we do first is uh, we have to reestablish the receivable. 
So we are going to basically reverse what we did here. So we've got to reverse that. So our credit is going to be to the bad debt expense. Okay, so we're going to credit that. And then we're going to debit or reestablish our accounts receivable account uh, with that same amount. The amounts are the same in this uh, instant. They're all $9,200 in my example. Yours might be a different number, of course. Uh, but you're going to handle that the same. So we're going to reestablish the receivable so that then they can go ahead and pay it off. So the payoff is pretty simple, right? We're going to collect cash in this case. That's going to be our debit. And then our credit will be accounts receivable to uh, for your company. And then that's going to be our credit. Uh, actually, credit in or um, getting rid of that account receivable that we have for their company the right way. We like to give, receive cash and get uh, and reduce the receivables that way. Not bad debt expense. We don't like that, but uh, we will do it if we, if we see that it's necessary. All right, so now we're going to go into some different methods. That's that one that we covered there. That is the easiest way to do it. Uh, super easy to manage. Uh, not gap approved though. Right, so let's talk about our gap approved method. Uh, we're going to have that, it's called the allowance for doubtful accounts. So that's going to be something that we're going to use, and we're going to use the percent of sales method, and we also have the um, uh, our accounts receivable um, aging method and percent of accounts receivable as well. So there's, there's the main overarching allowance for doubtful accounts, so that's what we're going to do. There's actually three different ways to do it. One is percent of sales, one is percent of accounts receivable, and the other is accounts receivable age. So we'll walk through all three of those really quick. So the basic, the basic idea with allow, allowance for doubtful accounts is it's a new account. It's a new account we're gonna establish here. And um, with that, we are going to uh, draw up let me draw up the T accounts real, real quick here to just kind of show you how that works. Okay, so the allowance for doubtful accounts typically is going to be a, uh, so we've got an asset here. So let's just draw this out here. Assets equals liabilities plus equity, right? That's our accounting equation there. We've got our accounts receivable sitting out here as an asset. There it is. And uh, our allowance for doubtful accounts is going to sit in here with the assets. It's going to be a contra account to our accounts receivable. So this is going to be our, we'll say, allow, let's see if I can get this right here, uh, DA. We'll just, we'll just call it that. Allowance for doubtful accounts. That is going to sit there. Typically, the typical balance in the allowance for doubtful accounts is going to be when we have more of an allowance, we're going to have more of a credit, right? Because these offset their contract. Less of an allowance, it's going to be a debit. So these are kind of coupled together here. Um, and really, one of the main ideas is if you have your allowance that you've created, then that's going to offset your some of your accounts receivable and allow you to state your account receivable balance correctly and and so what is the allowance for doubtful accounts? Well, the idea is you're going to estimate ahead of time, as soon as you make, uh, as soon as you're right, you're gonna estimate ahead of time how much you're probably not gonna collect. And so starting off, this is kind of one of the easiest ways to do this is using a percent of sales. So let's say you have a certain amount of sales. In this case, we have $664,000 in sales. And we're estimating that we will not collect a 0.7% of those sales. And so the idea is you should be able to quickly just be able to say, okay, here's uh, 664,000 in sales. We multiply that by 0 .0, uh, yep, 0 0.0, yep, 0 0.0 seven, there we go, that's 0.7%, uh, right? The percent, if we had 1%, it would be in, 
it would be 0 0.01. We have 0.7%, and so it's 0 0.007. So that's going to give you then your uh, estimated allowance. So this is going to be our estimated allowance. And what that will, what that means is, is that you will, uh, you think that that's how much you're not going to be collecting on, on that 664,000. Okay. And so the way we, the way we set that up at the very beginning, this is going to be our first journal entry that we're going to use with this. Is we have to then uh, calculate that and then say, okay, let's enter it into our system. We're going to credit our allowance for doubtful accounts, we are going to debit a bad debt expense. That's going to be our expense account that will receive the debit. So these are the combining accounts here, debit, bad debt expense, credit allowance for doubtful accounts for this amount right here. Okay, so that's going to be our first journal entry. And that will establish an allowance balance in there. Now, as we go on, um, what we're going to find is that, sure enough, there will be people that will not um, pay us. And so what do we do when that happens, right? So we see here, Chan is uh, not going to pay us this $332. Before we go on to that real quick, let me just tell you this about percent of sales method, right? So the allowance for doubtful account, it is going to be uh, a permanent account. It's not going to be um, closed. And so it may already have a balance in there when you do this entry. So let's say, for example, we're doing this entry every at the end of every year. We're going to calculate our allowance and we're going to put it out there. At the end of that year, you may already have a balance out there. Um, for the percent of sales method, we don't care if there's a balance in there currently. We're doing this for the sales for that period. We're just going to go ahead and calculate our estimated allowance, and we're just going to do the entry that we talked about here, where we're going to debit our bad debt expense and credit our allowance for doubtful accounts. We're just going to go ahead and put that, uh, do that entry. We're not going to worry about what the balance is. That'll be different when we uh, when we do our accounts receivable side of things. So, um, a, or a different method. This is one method. There's other methods. Okay, so let's get back to Chan here with that $332. Well, what we're going to say is Chan is going to not be able to pay us. So what do we do? Well, we're going to, we already have recorded our bad debt expense. So we don't record any more dad, bad debt expense. Instead, what we do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to debit our allowance for doubtful accounts. I'll just say A, D, A, allowance, whoops, not P. ADA, allowance for doubtful accounts, that's going to be our debit. So we're using up some of that allowance that we estimated it. And so we're going to debit it. We're going to say basically we're going to use up some of that that we estimated beforehand. And we're going to credit our accounts receivable. In this case, it's for Chan. That's going to be our credit. There we go. Credit there. So that is going to reduce our accounts receivable for Chan, get rid of it basically, right? Reduce it up for what we're not getting paid for and also say this is part of our allowance that we're going to be on there. Now if Chan comes back, uh, uh, oh, whoop, this is Park, sorry. Got the wrong person. Park, there we go. Park, we're Chan. Okay, uh, so this is Park that we're doing this for. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's Park's accounts receivable here. Uh, so now we're going to turn around and maybe Park's going to actually pay us. Well, uh, we're going to do just like we did before on the direct write-off method to reestablish. We're going to reverse what we did. So if they figure out things and they're like, they come to us and they say, oh, yeah, we'll actually pay you. We wrote it off before or we did this allowance uh, adjustment for Park. Now we have to reverse that. And then we're going to collect, of course, the cash. Uh, that'll be our debit. And then once after we reestablish it, and then we'll have our accounts receivable for park. 
There we go, got it right this time, will be credited. And that's the way we like to reduce our accounts receivables is by collecting cash. So that's going to be that one there. We're going to go ahead and continue on here. This is the allowance for doubtful accounts. Same concept with the allowance, but in order to figure out what that estimated amount is, we're going to use a different method. This is called the accounts receivable aging method or aging of accounts receivable method. Um, I've heard it both ways. So what we're going to say, what we're going to do is we're going to line out all of our accounts receivables and how long they've been outstanding. So the items that have been outstanding the longest, of course, we're going to say there's a higher chance that we're not going to collect it versus the items that we just uh, sold and have accounts receivable for. So. So that's kind of the scale there. We're going to go ahead and plug these numbers in. So this is the amount not due. 402 goes there. 1% is going to go here. Uh, our 1 to 30 days, that's going to plug in here, right? So you kind of see the idea, 2% will plug in there. So we're just going to fill this out. That will give us uh, an amount down in here that is our estimated balance of, allow of our allowance account. Different than the sales, once we do this, we're doing this for accounts receivable, our accounts receivable aging method and our percent of accounts receivable, there's something different that we do for this one. This amount right here is going to become our balance, right? So we do care about if there's a balance currently in the allowance account. And so that's going to be something we know that this has to be a credit balance that's normally the balance for in the allowance account so that will be a credit balance so what does that look like well let's take a look here once we get that all set we're, we're gonna have these um these different scenarios for us to deal with so this first one it says we currently have forty two hundred dollars credit in there so our allowance There we go. Our allowance for doubtful accounts is sitting here. This is the T account. It currently has $4,200 over on this side. It's credit balance. That's where it's supposed to be. That's kind of where the side we like on the allowance for doubtful accounts, right? And so we have, a, we have an amount that we need to from back over here, right? So if we go back over here, we have this amount that's with the star, whatever amount we have here, right? That amount needs to become our new balance. So what we need to do is we need to say, okay, currently we have this estimated amount from the other, from the last one that we just did. So our estimate minus, if we have a credit, we're going to subtract the credit that's in there already because if it's already in there, we don't need to actually add it in to get our balance right because we want our estimated amount to become our balance so we subtract the credit that'll tell us how much we need to uh enter in for to basically adjust the balance to the correct amount so we're going to add in our adjustment on this side and then that will become the estimated balance that we need to have it become on the credit side right does that make sense hopefully that makes sense if you if you have a problem with this, uh, reach out, let me know, and I'll, I'll help you out. Uh, okay, so let's do the, the next scenario here, C. This is scenario B over here. The scenario C is going to look a little different because we ha have our allowance account here. Okay, allowance for doubtful accounts. And then uh, the balance, actually, it says it's a $700 debit balance. Well, that's on the wrong side. That means that last period... We didn't estimate enough and we actually got more uh, debt that we wrote off, right? Then we had a, we had estimated. So that gives us a debit balance. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but what we do have to do here is just when we re-estimate and get that estimate out there, we want to uh, figure out, uh, we want we need to do it a little different so we can get this estimate that we want right here, right? So this time, instead of, subtracting it we're going to be adding it so we've got our estimated amount that we need to begin with we've got that from the previous example uh, on the previous page 
we add in this $700 debit, that's going to give us our adjustment amount that we need to make. And that adjustment will still be on the credit side. Okay, so the, the entry is going to look like this. We're going to do uh, bad debt expense. That's going to be our debit. And then our allowance for doubtful accounts will be our credit. Oops, there we go, our credit. This is the allowance for doubtful account adjustment. That's not the actual, that's not the actual account. That's, I'm just trying to tie this in with this, right? This is your adjustment amount that you're putting in there. And so, so the amount that we, we credit here, debit and credit is going to be this adjusted amount that we figure out from these equations here, this equation, whatever we're doing, depends, it totally depends on what balance you currently have an allowance, the allowance for doubtful accounts on what that adjusting entry is to get us to uh, the balance that we need. Okay, so that's going to be one way to do it. The percent of sales method, we don't have to do that. See, this this way we do. This, this way it's a little simpler because we don't have to do our whole uh, table matrix of with all of our um, aging and the different percentages to calculate our estimated allowance, right? Balance that we want. The percent of accounts receivable is super easy. We just take our accounts receivable balance here and we multiply it by whatever percent uh, we're estimating, okay? So it could be like 6%, for example. And if it was 6%, we would multiply it by 0 0.06, right? It would be 6%. And that would then give us the, our, our uh, that's our new estimated balance, uh, AR ba uh, allowance balance, right? Uh, balance, right? And so that's our balance, of course, just like the aging method, this will become our balance, that amount there, that starred here. That's going to be it. And again, we're going to do this the same way. These two, B and C, one we've got a credit. So we're going to be subtracting these two things. The other debit here, we're going to have to add on. We're going to add these two together and do that entry. The entry is the same. Debit our... Um, debit our bad debt expense, credit our allowance for doubtful accounts. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Again, contact me if you have questions and we'll help you through it. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start our uh, second part here. So this will be our second part. This is the notes payable, um, or just our payables in general. We're gonna do notes payable with interest, and then we're gonna do some um, payables uh, in relation to payroll, so our payroll payable. Okay, so the the main idea with this, so this is the equation that I need to have you kind of memorize or understand to be able to calculate these. Uh, so what we've got here is we've got a uh, note, we borrowed money, and we have to pay interest. So this is a payable on our side. So how do we calculate that? Um, the interest that we need to pay, well, it's going to be this. We're going to take the principal. Times the interest, right? Times our interest rate. And then we're going to multiply by what we call the fraction of year. year okay so for this first one let's walk through here so it's going to be twelve thousand that's our principal eight percent is going to be what we're going to multiply it by and we when we put this into our calculator it'll be 0 0.08 right unless you have a percent button then use the percent button now that alone will give us a whole year's worth of interest because these interest rates we're using is our annual interest rates. So unless otherwise stated, 
any any interest rate you're given is going to be an annual interest rate. So it'll calculate a whole year of interest for you. We don't want that. Our note isn't that long. It's only 45 days long. So now what we need to do is we need to multiply that total annual interest amount uh, by uh, the fraction of year. In this case, it's in number of days. So it's 45 days. And we're going to be using for our years, the days in our year, we're going to be using 360. We're assuming 30 days per month. That's just an average kind of easy way that we do it. Um, and so some institutions, some uh, out there as you calculate this, this is just a one method to, to use and simplify the calculation of interest is use a 360 day a year. Some institutions or, or calculations are not going to use that. They're going to use the 364 days, actual days in the year, and that's fine too. So either way, the way we're going to do it here is we're using 360 day a year. So it makes it a lot easier. Then what that's going to equal is that will equal our interest. Okay, so that's, that's our calculation. Okay, so fill these in. We got our principal here, uh, we got our rate, we got the time, which is the fraction, you'll be able to select that. It'll be 45 over 360. And then of course our total interest is what we just walked through to, to put in there, okay? Um, that is the total through maturity, meaning if you were to take it the whole 45 days. So one of the tricks here is we've got to figure out the interest recognized uh, as of the end of the year, because we start this December 13th, and uh, if we go 45 days, that's on into the next year, right? And so what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to split the interest up a little bit and and, and put it in the correct accounting periods, because that's just the correct way to do it. Okay, and so what we're going to do here is we're going to do the same calculation we did before. The difference we're going to use here is the difference will be the time. So uh, for this first one, what you'll find is, is it's 18 days until December 31st divided by 360. That's the only difference. You're going to use the same amount and you're going to multiply it by this fraction instead. And that will give you the interest uh, up until December 31st. Okay, so that'll help you there. So do that calculation, that'll give you that amount. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and we're going to continue and we're gonna have a couple more notes we're gonna have to calculate. We've got one from uh, Thomas, one from Chang. We're gonna finish out the one from Lee. So it looks like Lee here, we've got, we're gonna do this calculation. This is gonna be the same right here. This in this, that'll be the same that you just did. The 31st, again, we just calculated that. That'll be the same. So you can just kind of copy paste those over. We're going to have to recognize the rest of what we did uh, to then come to the maturity of that note. So January 1st through January 27th. So what we're going to do on that is we're going to uh, take our uh, amount and we're going to the difference is going to be here, right? It'll be our time. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Turn back my pen there. There we go. Okay, so the time is going to be what's different again. In this case, for the rest of it, what you're going to use is the rest should be 27 days, 27 over 360. Well, that'll be your fraction of year for the rest of that. You could also just subtract um, interest, you know, total interest. You should, could subtract what you did through December 31st. That'll give you the rest. That's uh, so kind of a quick way to kind of check it as well. But really what's happening is we've got December, oops, December 13th is when that note originates. We're going to go through... December 31st is going to be the end of the year, right? So we got to go through to December 31st and calculate interest there. 
Then we're going to keep going to January 27th. Okay. And so what we're going to do, that's super important for our journal entries, is we are going to record back here in number five. We are going to record uh, back in your previous problem. You have got to do um, so two journal entries there. Number one you're going to create the notes receivable to begin with, right? So that's going to be a journal entry. Your note receivable Oh, so these are receivables. So just just to note this, right? This is not a payable. These are receivables on here. Yeah. So I got that wrong, but that's okay. Okay, so this is going to be a note receivable. Oops, there we go. For, um, and on our case, it's going to be for Lee, right? That first one, that'll be your debit. You're going to create that note receivable. Where does that come from? Well, what happened with Lee is they didn't pay their account with us. And so we're going to go ahead and say, okay, we'll go ahead and not send you to collections. We're not going to write off your account or anything. We're just going to say, we're going to structure it in a note. We're going to write out, you're going to pay us in, uh, you will pay us in so many days, 45 days, right, is this one, at so much percent interest, and you are going to uh, pay us on January 27th, right? That's going to be our new deal. And so we're going to turn in, where do we get that? Well, it's going to be from their accounts receivable. If they would, if they would have paid it normally, we would have just kind of got the oh, the accounts receivable. And so what we're doing is we're turning their accounts receivable into a notes receivable because now it's structured. It has interest accruing and a, a new date on it. So that's kind of the legal document behind this accounting entry. So we're taking their accounts receivable for Lee and we're turning it into a notes receivable. Then for the interest at the end of the year, so this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have, uh, we didn't get paid the interest, so we have interest. Uh, there we go. Interest receivable. Okay, so here's our interest receivable. That'll be our debit for that interest we calculated accrued in December 31st. And then we have uh, our interest revenue. Revenue, because we earned it. Time passed, so we earned our interest revenue there. So that's what it's gonna be like. That'll be for the chapter five. Now, as we go forward with these other journal entries, one of the tricks is this. We've got this interest receivable here. We got a note receivable here. Right. So what happens at the very end in January 27th when they finally pay us? Right. We're going to collect cash. That's going to be one thing we're going to collect. So let me do another another journal entry here quick. So my next journal entry, let's let's make this in another color so we can see it different. So I'm going to receive this. This is when I actually receive payment. This is what what, what it's going to look like. I'm going to receive cash. Okay, that's going to be a debit. Interest in this year, interest in this year from January to, to 1st of January 27th is going to be more interest, um, interest revenue. Okay, um, and then I'm also going to have more, uh, I'm also going to collect on my receivables. So, I'm going to have my note receivable. I'm going to have my interest receivable. And I'm going to have more interest revenue. That's going to be credit. 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 
that'll add up to my cash that I receive. Okay, this interest receivable is from December 31st. This interest revenue is everything from January into the next year. The note receivable is the note receivable. So that's what it is. So that's how it comes together when we do our journal entries for these notes um, receivable, not payable. I made a mistake there, put the wrong thing up at the, up at the top there. It's not a note payable, it's a note receivable. Um, when we finally get paid off, we're gonna collect cash. That'll be our debit right up front. We're gonna write off the note receivable and the interest receivable, any if there is any from a prior period. If not, then it'll just be all interest revenue from the current period. So that's something to look at as well. Okay, so now we're going on to payroll calculations. Now, the, this is the payable side. This isn't receivable. These are payables that we're gonna do here. Okay, so our payables are gonna be um, uh, how much we owe in taxes in this case, right? That'll be a payable that we have to pay. When we run payroll, uh, we got to pay our employees, of course, but we also then have to pass money on to the government as well. So we're going to calculate that real quick. These are different scenarios for de depending on the, the pay amount. So scenario A, we have a certain amount that we've paid so far, and now we're looking at September. So September is our current payroll that we're looking at. B, we've got a little less, right? This is a little lower pay amount. C is quite a higher pay amount as well. So we got these three scenarios and we've got, to, we've got to treat them all a little differently. And so the way it works with these, we've got four types of taxes we're gonna consider. So we've got our FICA social security tax. That's gonna be at this percent, 6.2%. It has what's called a cap on it. So that means that we're gonna be paying the 6.2% all the way up until we get to $137,700 of payroll. On the $137,701, that $1 and all the other dollars beyond that are not subject to tax. Everything up to that point is subject. Okay, so that's that one. That's gonna be Social Security, FICA Social Security. FICA Medicare, there is no cap, so everything's subject to the 1.45%. No cap, so we don't have to worry about that one. That one's easy. Then we've got FUDA, or unemployment, federal unemployment and state unemployment tax. Both of those will have uh, a cap, $7,000 cap there. They have different rates as well. So the cap works the same way I explained the FICA Social Security cap. The first $7,000 will be taxed. After you get past that, then the $7,001, first dollars will not be taxed and beyond there, okay? So just that first amount. But let's look at this first A here. We've got $5,300 we've uh, paid out so far. We're gonna pay that employee $2,600 in September. Let's look at FICA Social Security first here. Will we reach $137,700? Will we reach that cap? No, not even close. So that means the whole amount of the September payroll is subject and it will be 6.2%, okay? Okay, Medicaid or Medicare, no cap. So we don't have to worry about that anyways. So everything's subject there, right? And then we're now we're looking at the federal and state unemployment. Will we reach $7,000? Yeah, we will. We will reach $7,000. How long will it take us to get there? Well, we're gonna take our $7,000 cap. We're gonna go ahead and subtract $5,300 from it. Okay, and we'll see how long it's gonna take us. All right, so it'll take us 700, it looks like uh, $1,700, is that right? I think that's right, $1,700. So that means this $1,700 that it takes us to get up to the cap will be subject. Everything else will not be subject. So we're gonna go ahead and plug our $1,700 in here, $1,700. And then you just gotta uh, pull down the 
uh, right rates here. There's Medicare. Here's our FUDA is 0 0.6. And then our SUDA is 5.4. There we go. And it'll calculate that out there for you. So we're going to do that with B and C. One thing you'll find is B is really low. So B might not hit any cap. So maybe everything's going to be subject, right? So just think about that. C is going to be quite a bit higher. So that that is where we're actually going to be hitting that FICA Social Security cap. So not all of this $8,800 for C will be subject to FICA Social Security. So calculate the amount that will be. Only part of that. The part that gets us up to the 137700 Your number might be different for yours that you're uh, looking at that. Your different scenarios might have different numbers. But take a look at that. Medicare, we don't have to worry about it. Everything's subject to it. Uh, FUDA and SUDA on, on um, scenario C as well. Uh, we're so high, we're way past the gap, right? So uh, just think about that. Nothing's going to be subject on C for FUDA and SUDA. So hopefully that helps you. Give you a little direction on that. And you'll be able to fill in the rest and get that right. Uh, we're going to move over now to... Um, let's see, whoops, on the wrong direction. Uh, I'm going to pause here just real quick. All right, so we're going to go ahead and continue here. Uh, we are going to be doing uh, the next, it's number eight. Uh, really, it's part of what we just finished, right? So we're going to be using, it says, assume situation A, right? So whatever your A situation was uh, back here, right? So this is A. This is A. So whatever information you got there, you're going to be using some of that going forward. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put in here, we're going to put in the FICA Social Security and FICA uh, Medicare, Medicare, there we go, In fr from what you got in your scenario A on that last page, you're just going to be putting in here. So that's going to be easy, and that'll be uh, created there. We're going to add that up there at the bottom, including our federal income tax. So that's going to be part of what we do. This is really the employee, the employee side of things. So this is what employees see taken out. So they don't see, like, for example, in this case, we're not taking out any unemployment tax. That's all employer burden. They have to pay that, not the employee. Okay. So we're going to go on and we're going to finish out our, uh, let's, see, let's finish out the, the journal entry here and just kind of give you a clue of what that's going to look like. So we're going to have one debit and the rest will be credit. Okay, so the one debit is going to be something we call this is the, this is salaries expense. Okay, and that is going to be our gross uh, salaries. That's going to be our gross salary there, and then we're going to have our FICA Social Security. We're going to have our FICA Medicare. We are going to have our uh, federal. It's going to be, let's call it employee federal income tax on there. That's going to be, these are all credits. This is the debit right here. This one's going to be the debit. These are all going to be credits here, right? And then we're going to have one more credit. This one's what we call salaries payable. Salaries payable. And what that is, is that's the net uh, that's your take-home pay, right? And so what that's going to be is it's going to be this number, the gross pay, minus all of these tax deductions will equal our uh, salaries payable. So that's going to be kind of a number you're going to calculate at the very end once you get all the once you get all those deductions taken out. Okay, and so that that will be the employee side of things. The next one we're going to look at is 
we're using situation A again, and this one's going to be the employer payroll side. So what does the employer payroll side look like? Well, we're going to have on there, we're going to have our uh, matching FICA. This is FICA uh, Social Security. Oops, Social Security. This is our Medicare again, FICA Medicare. And the employer on this one is going to do the FUDA, Federal Unemployment, and SUDA, State Unemployment. And this will come all from the previous work you've done. You can just kind of bring those over, plug in the rates. You already know what this is. Just pull it over. The tax rates are going to be the same. And that'll calculate a number here that will be the employer payroll tax expense. Uh, we're going to then move over to the journal entry and the journal entry is going to look like this. So we're going to have the payroll, uh, our payroll tax expense, that'll be the total there. That'll be our total debit right there. And then the rest of these are going to be credits. They're going to be payables. We're going to line them up. They'll show up on our balance sheet. Hopefully, we're going to be we're going to be paying these off. We're going to be writing checks or doing our uh, direct deposits or direct transfers to pay for these items. It's going to be all four of these that we got over here. It's going to be our two FICAs and our two unemployments. They're going to plug in here for these four credits that we're going to have here, and they they will equal the debit. So really, we're just translating this table calculation we did over to our journal entry. So, so hopefully that helps you. That'll be the payroll side, our payables. And then the last one that we're going to do here is, is kind of uh, similar to what we've done, but it's going to be um, uh, more holistic, right? So we're going to take the hours of regular pay, but these are the total hours worked up here, right? Whatever yours is. The hours, regular pay, of course, is 40 hours a week, right? Anything over 40 hours a week is going to be uh, premium pay. So the hourly rate, uh, our regular pay is $12. And then this is going to be $12 times 1.5 or time and a half, right? Uh, it will be that over overtime pay. We're going to do our FICA. Medicare and Social Security, you know the rates. The rates are back here, right here, 6.2%, 1.45. That will be calculated off gross. So whatever this gross is right here, right? This is the gross pay. All of our hours added up. We're going to just multiply that by the percentages and give us these amounts here. Uh, our income tax deduction is going to be a little different. This one, we're actually going to be using this table up here, this exhibit 11A.6. We're going to use that to get our income tax deduction. To do that, we have to know a couple of things. One, we've got to know our gross pay. So we've got to calculate that. Number two, we've got to know how many allowances. This person has three allowances. Um, they are unmarried as well. So we've got to know that as well. Unmarried with three allowances. So that'll help us here on this table. So when we pull up this table, let me see if I can do this here real quick. Pull up this table that you can see. I'll pull it into the view here. Here we go. So here's our view. So there's the table. And so what we're going to do again, we're single. So this is the right one, single persons right here. And we're going to do these numbers across the top are going to be our allowances. So we have three allowances. So we're going to be using this column here. We're going to be going down to our wherever our pay is, our gross pay is, right? And that's going to be the number we're going to pull back. So whatever this number is here, we're going to pull that back to here. That'll be our number we're going to put into that amount there uh, for tax deduction. We're going to pull that off the table, right? 
So this comes from the table. Okay. All right. Then these are our deductions, our total deductions here. We're going to total those up. And it'll be gross minus the total. So this will be minus, right? We're going to subtract that equals our net pay. So hopefully that helps you. That's, you know, kind of how your paycheck's calculated, right? So hopefully you can understand this and maybe it'll help you out with your paycheck. Some of you already may know this. That's great. And um, uh, so you will be able to fill it out pretty quick. So, all right. Well, thank you. Hopefully that helps. Feel free to contact me if you have any further questions, anything I can help you with. More than happy to do it. Thanks. Bye.